Hello and welcome to 20 Years On Crossing Bridges for Reconciliation, a special event brought to you by the ABC and Reconciliation Australia. I'm Larissa Berendt. 20 years ago, 250,000 people walked across the Sydney Harbour Bridge in support of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. The historic moment and similar events held across the country were collectively the largest demonstration of support for an issue that has ever taken place in Australia. Joining me to reflect on the significance of those events are Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ken Wyatt, Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, the Honourable Linda Burney, CEO of Reconciliation Australia, Karen Mundine, and health researcher and lecturer at the University of Wollongong, Summer May Finlay. Linda Burney, I want to start with you because you played such a prominent role with the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation and with the New South Wales Reconciliation Movement. What was the context context for the bridge walks. Well, hi Larissa and hi to my fellow panellists. Uh, the context was that there had been a 10-year formal process of reconciliation. Uh, the Federal Parliament unanimously agreed to a formal process in Australia and the first Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation was established with Patrick Dodson as the chairperson. Uh, the process was for 10 years and uh, Corroboree 2000, uh, of which the bridge walk was part of, uh, was held to commemorate the end of the reconciliation process. And the uh, final document of the Council for Reconciliation was delivered uh, the prior day on the 27th of May, which of course is the anniversary of the referendum in Australia, uh, to the then Prime Minister, who had refused to apologise and say sorry to the stolen generations. Just the most incredible day, Larissa, uh, on the 28th of May, uh, when tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Australians walked across Sydney Harbour Bridge and, as you say, other walks uh, over the next week throughout the country to demonstrate the support for the reconciliation movement. And for you personally, how did the mood on the day feel? <laughs> well, it was just remarkable. Uh, we'd organised to keep the bridge open for three hours, thinking that we'd get everyone across in, in three hours. By the time I crossed the bridge and got to Darling Harbour, we were frantic in phone calls saying we've still got thousands of people um, at Milsons Point that haven't crossed over. So we had to do some very quick work uh, through the police and roads and traffic and maritime services and whoever else to keep the bridge open for an additional, I think it was two or three hours, to move people across. It was just the most remarkable blue cold, clear Sydney late autumn day. Minister Wyatt, you participated in the walks. What was the mood and the emotions you felt and what were your hopes for the day? Hi to my fellow panellists. I, when I walked across there I was filled with emotion because I had a lasting image of Pat Dodson when he delivered his final speech walking off stage and he was walking down a road and at that time mm. I thought I hope this is not the end and then when I walked across the bridge with so many others I saw it as the beginning so I had the culmination of two images and I still look back and look at how it brought us into mainstream Australia's view and we had fellow Australians walking and talking uh, across that bridge and Linda's right I was in the tail end of the area and it was an incredible experience just watching uh, that massive stream of people committed to reconciliation walk across that bridge. And the emotions do build up in you. Did you have that understanding that that moment was going to be as historic as it was? Symbolically, yes. Uh, any walk across the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is iconic, would have left anybody in that time with a visual image that when you see it, it evokes so many emotions and high degrees of optimism. Karen Mundine, you worked for the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation at the time. What was your day like? 
Yeah, thanks, Larissa, and hello to my fellow panellists. Um, uh, yeah, I was working back then. Um, it started as a bit of a blur, I have to say. We'd come off uh, Corroboree 2000, there was lots going on. Um, and I don't think it was until um, the morning when I came out of the hotel right near North Sydney Station and just saw the sea of people that were there. And I think that was the moment that kind of hit me that actually this is something. Um, like everyone else, it was a cold morning, it was a bit windy, uh, but there was a real kind of uh, uh, excitement in the air. And I think that's what, that emotion is what stays with me. And walking mm. across the bridge and seeing sort of people in those trains that were heading towards North Sydney Station, jam-packed in and they just, it was constant, it, it wasn't stopping. And it was a real kind of sense of hope and uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, Summer May Finlay, you must have been in your late teens about that time. What did the day mean for younger Indigenous Australians and for you personally? Hi Larissa and hello to my fellow panellists. For me, I look back on that event and I'm in absolute awe, particularly listening to all of the panellists speak about it. I mean, at the time, I remember it and it was quite significant and I didn't quite realise the significance of it until much later. And for young people like me, when I hear Annie Linda and Uncle Ken and, and Karen talk about this event that they all participated in, it really demonstrates the legacy that they're leaving and the legacy that younger people like myself have, have to follow in their footsteps. And I'm really proud to, to be able to be on this panel to hear these stories, but also know that we're progressing that journey of reconciliation 20 years on. Minister White, we hear this word legacy a lot about that day, that moment. When you look back on it now, 20 years later, how do you describe the actual legacy of that moment? I think it was a crucial turning point for Australia and I watched the work that Linda did as, uh, in her chairing and stewardship that influenced the corporate sector of this country to take on board the whole concept of reconciliation. We see the culmination of that now through the efforts of so many where we've got reconciliation action plans. And you've got the corporate sector now in many senses immersing itself in being in partnership uh, with Indigenous Australians. We've still got a long way to go on many fronts, but we are far better now than what we were uh, at the time prior to reconciliation. And I want to acknowledge the work that Patrick Dodson did when they bought, when the council bought back those five significant reports and released them, it forced government agencies to have to reflect on those reports and start to rethink how we engaged better with our people. Minister White, when one looks back at the commentary around the country on the day, uh, a lot of it focused on the Prime Minister's uh, refusal to apologise to the stolen generations. And I wonder what your reflections are now on that moment and to what extent that might have marred the reconciliation process. I think that whole thrust of reconciliation and the bridge walk uh, surpasses that. I've got to know John Howard extremely well uh, over the years since that time. And I know that he would have received advice saying it was a risk. And he was committed um, to wanting to have change. And in discussions I've had with him, he's never um, really reconciled from the need for that apology to have been given. I think the trouble we have sometimes as um, ministers, and Linda will find this when she becomes a minister, there is always this risk adver aversion as opposed to sometimes a common sense approach for the betterment of a nation. And John, in his uh, subsequent years, like many other prime ministers, have become statespeople in the way in which they now uh, exert their influence to get people to rethink the way in which we're engaged as a nations of people from around uh, this geographic diversity of ours to be involved and to be seriously considered. Linda, the bridge walks took place around the country and back in 2000 you were actually very optimistic about the groundswell of public support for the reconciliation movement and I want to just play a clip that uh, was taken at that time of what you had to say about that. Uh, at the State Reconciliation Committee in New South Wales, and I think this is happening right across Australia, 
I mean, we're being practical and pragmatic. And what we have to do for the next two years, if the Prime Minister lasts for the next two years, is not going to say sorry, then what, what we are going to do is work with the 500,000 people that walked across that bridge today. We have to mobilise, we have to organise, and most of all, we will sustain this pro process. The legislation finishes in six months. The council has a lot of work to get people to sign up to that declaration. But the people are out there today and we saw those people today and that's who will carry the process. You can't take politics out of it. It's impossible. But it's the people out there that need sustaining because that is what will keep the politicians on their toes. And of course, you are a politician now, Linda. Um, <laughs> how do you feel now about uh, the extent to which that momentum did last? And do you think that the sort of groundswell of support that was possible at that time can happen again? I am convinced, Larissa, that the groundswell is still out there. Mm -hmm. It might be not as prominent. It might be not as focused. But it is out there. You can't have... Uh, a, de a decade of reconciliation and then the subsequent 20 years since where we've just made increasing um, gains in many areas, many areas we haven't and, and um, I acknowledge that, but many, many areas we have. We've got people in the media like yourself, we've got so many people in higher education right throughout the professions, uh, year 12 attainment, kids going to preschool. There are still some shocking problems around poverty and isolation and racism, that's true. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that we have uh, the capacity for this country that's getting better and better at owning its truth. We see around the country the establishment of memorials to massacres. I'm thinking of the Mile Creek Memorial, of course, uh, which is such a significant thing here in New South Wales. So I believe that the goodwill is still there. Um, I believe it can be tapped into again. Um, and I am also very, very hopeful for the future, uh, notwithstanding the fact that there is still so much to do. And finally, uh, what constantly just amazes me, Larissa, is the generosity of First Nations people. Uh, for all that's happened to us, for the, sto for the history, uh, for the stories that we still know, uh, for those people that were taken as children, people are still putting their hand out to say, come walk with us, we can only do it together. Karen Mundine, Reconciliation Australia was established after the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation finished its work. How has it defined its role? Well, it defines everything. That's the legacy that we inherited. And uh, our challenge was how do we turn those uh, quarter of a million Australians that walked with us in Sydney and, and the tens of thousands that walked around the country, how do we turn those good intentions into actions? And what we've been doing in the last 20 years through programs like our Reconciliation Action Plan program, so working with organisations to think about what their contribution is and what their sphere of influence can be to change. Uh, and now we're going to Wally, our schools and education program, which is again working within the schools and education, which is so important to that next generation of Australians. Uh, we continue to work with Stolen Generations and the Healing Foundation, uh, the work we've done around Indigenous governance. So looking at the strength of when we as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people actually control and engage uh, and make decisions around our lives and our communities and the institutions that affect us, uh, the difference and the positive outcomes that that can make. So all of these things um, in the last 20 years have been about how do we make good on the promises of all of those people that walked across the bridge uh, 20 years ago. And, and I have to say, you know, as Linda said, um, there's still ways to go. There are still things that we need to address and tackle and uh, we don't always get it right and we need to own that as well. But um, I feel that we're, we're channelling people into, into different ways. Uh, we're making good on the promises of that Declaration of Reconciliation. Just wondering if, as a follow-up question to that, you could just maybe highlight what some of the challenges and some of the achievements for Reconciliation Australia have been in the last 20 years. 
Oh, so, as I said, there's so many. Um, with our Reconciliation Action Plan program, we've got 1,100 organisations that are, in their own ways, thinking about how they support uh, the aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, whether that's through employment, whether it's thinking about engaging with those uh, Indigenous businesses uh, or customers and how do we provide better services. Um, again, with education, it's looking at um, nearly 7,000 schools and early learning centres that are engaging. I think the challenge is always um, a question of it's so much that we're doing. We're trying to unpack in 20 years, um, 200 plus years of history uh, and disadvantage. Uh, so that's going to take a while. But I really see the, the, the support and um, the intentions of organisations and individuals to make a difference uh, and just continue to work at it. Summer, from your perspective, what have been the key achievements of reconciliation over the last 20 years? For me, I think about, well, on, on a personal level, I think about the opportunities that I've been afforded are a absolute success rec from a reconciliation point of view and a lot of other Aboriginal people, myself and younger, have had a lot of opportunities that my mother and my grandmother, for example, didn't have. And when I look at, say, higher education, we are seeing more and more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people not just go through the university system, but come back like me to teach. And I teach because I want to actually see young people go through and work with our mob much better. And when I'm actually sitting in the classroom, I, I hear stories about, and, and I hear really important questions being posed to me and my colleagues by the students in a way that I certainly didn't have when I was going to do my undergrad in 2004. So for me, one of the biggest legacies has been the important level of base knowledge that people have now. Having said that though, while Annie Linda did talk about there has been you know, the massacre map and memorials, I still think there more needs to be done in terms of telling the true history around this story, mm -hmm. which is one of the principles within the Uluru Statement, for example. Just a bit more generally as well, following up from what you've been saying, how do you think um, the broader Australian community now um, appreciates the level at which they're seeing Indigenous experience and um, perspective? Do you think that's uh, something that's filtered from the education space into society more broadly or do we still have a long way to go? Look, I still think we have a long way to go, but we've come a long way. So for me, reconciliation is a process. So I think times like this, we need to stop and reflect on, which is what we're doing, on the successes we've had. But we also do need to recognise that there needs to be greater representation in the media. There needs to be greater representation at higher levels in business, not for profits, and also in the university and the school sector. I think that once we actually see more of our mob actually in all spheres of the workforce and society, we'll actually start seeing more successes. Uh, Minister White, you worked in the area of Indigenous health before becoming a Member of Parliament and I'm interested to ask you about that area specifically, but before I do, I just wondered if you had a general reflection on what you see as the impact of reconciliation over the last 20 years. Larissa, what impacted was when the Prime Minister rang me to offer me my portfolio, that was on Sorry Day. And that whole Reconciliation Week then meant something very different in the way that I looked at where we had been to where we are and where we need to go for the future. Having worked in two health systems, what I've seen is an improvement by uh, two systems, particularly WA and New South Wales, where I enjoyed incredible uh, opportunities and experiences of working alongside our people and community controlled health organisations, to influence mainstream thinking, to change the mindset that we have skills within our own communities. And I'm immensely proud of the number of Indigenous doctors and nurses, allied health staff, who have gone through pathways into mainstream roles, but equally working in our own organisations. Yes, we've still got gaps uh, because of the way in which people live uh, with chronic health conditions, diabetes, etc. But our understanding and knowledge is far richer because of the contribution that so many people have made. Uh, the leadership of Nacho, uh, the leadership at the local community level, and particularly during this COVID period, 
I have never been more proud of our leadership when you consider out of 800,000 uh, Indigenous Australians, only 56 ended up with COVID-19 and they were in capital cities and regional centres. Leadership across the board from young and old uh, was extremely strong and it showed that we can make decisions, we can protect and I'm certainly basing that on my experiences in two jurisdictions where we can do some incredible things and Summer's right, we've still got to reach those pinnacles of the boards of corporate Australia. When we get into what is normal for everybody else and we're part of it, then reconciliation would have had its impact in a way that we would have not thought of when we walked across that bridge. Uh, Minister White, you did obviously cover some reflections on what has happened in the area of Indigenous health, but I just wanted to follow up and see if you wanted to add anything further in terms of your reflections on what reconciliation has achieved in that space. I see it, it's achieved a lot because uh, when I had Indigenous health as my portfolio, the corporate companies, the pharmaceuticals, have got wraps where they work alongside um, our organisations. They're doing work within community and, and they're giving. They're not asking for anything in return. They're not asking for government. And all of it is premised on their contributions through the reconciliation process and the wrap plans of so many organisations, including the, the Royal Colleges of the various professions. I uh, brought them together and asked if they would walk with us. Uh, they'd been walking with Nacho, but I wanted them to walk much more broadly with our community. And because of their reconciliation uh, action plans, they signed up to an agreement where they would work within the systems to make a difference, but would wo work alongside of our doctors, our nurses, and our allied health staff. So reconciliation has had a massive impact within the health structures and systems, which, but we've still got some embedded practices that are not conducive to our people accessing some of the services that, that exist across this nation, and we have to change that. Linda Burney, you worked uh, in the area of Indigenous education, mm. uh, really at the grassroots for a very long time before becoming a Member of Parliament. As, as Minister White said, the, the gap hasn't closed around some of the important health statistics. It also hasn't closed around some of our key education indicators as well. I was wondering from your perspective, over the last 20 years, what have you seen as the real uh, changes in the area of education and what do you see as the challenges? Uh, that is a very, um, very, very good question. I have a sense that some of the really powerful work that we did in the 80s and, and the 90s and the early part of, of 2000 around curriculum development, Aboriginal mm -hmm. perspectives to the curriculum, Aboriginal studies, Aboriginal languages, and, and making sure that Aboriginal community voices were loud and clear in directing uh, departments of education on, uh, on what they should be doing has actually, uh, has actually gone backwards a little bit. I might be wrong, but that's just my sense that uh, it's not as, as powerful as I thought it would be by now. It seems to me that the other thing that has been a great success is I cannot think of one university across this country that doesn't have a substantial um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or First Nations program, be it in um, uh, cultural safety, be it in uh, working across the various schools within universities and running programs. And Larissa, you're, you've been fundamental to that, to that movement um, at, uh, at uh, UTS. Uh, there is also some really good outcomes in the early childhood sector where Aboriginal uh, young, young children, uh, little ones, are getting access to an early childhood education in greater numbers uh, than ever before. But there we still need to ask ourselves, well, if all that's happening, 
Why are there still more kids getting locked up than ever before? Why are there more Aboriginal people in jail than ever before? Why is there still uh, more Aboriginal children in the statutory child protection system than ever before? They are some of the fundamental issues that I'm sure Ken and others have been referring to in what needs to be addressed. What about cardiovascular health and a whole range of other areas? And at the end of the day, I think where we're moving to now, and this has got a lot to do with um, ed the education systems of Larissa, but education more broadly across the community, is ac accepting the process of truth-telling. It's not about apportioning blame, it's about owning the truth, but also um, understanding that what's happened in the past, that um, intergenerational trauma still affects the way in which people participate, whether it's in the education system, uh, the health system, or any other of the um, systems that we're required to interact with today. Karen, this seems a, a good point to pick up with you because obviously broad education is one of the remits of Reconciliation Australia. And I was just wondering from your perspective as the head of the organisation, what are some of the strategies you're using to try and achieve uh, stronger education outcomes, both within schools and more broadly, that, that really help change perception about some of the issues that both Linda and Ken have raised? Yeah, so education is so fundamental to reconciliation and while we do have national curriculums and we do have um, some of those policies around uh, the teaching of that, what we found is that uh, it, often it's about um, uh, teachers and schools having confidence um, and having the resources to be able to teach. I think there is a broad recognition that this um, Indigenous histories, Indigenous cultures and teaching of that is really important. And we see a lot of teachers who, knowing how important it is and knowing that the role that they play in shaping young minds, um, not wanting to get it wrong. And so we've actually put a lot of time into thinking about how do we help teachers and schools with the resources and building confidence to be able to teach these things. Um, particularly in the early learning sector, as Linda mentioned, We've seen a great uptake there and that's about as much as teaching all young Australians, it's also about creating the right spaces and the, mm -hmm. the um, safe spaces for Aboriginal families to be involved in that. And we know how important um, access to that early learning is important to, to setting up for the life of young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Jarjum. So, um, our Narragunawali program uh, really focuses on that, a, a version of a reconciliation action plan, but set up for schools particularly. We've had over 4,000 early learning centres right across the country engage in that. And I've been lucky enough to, to visit some of those, um, those schools and they are amazing. They really are embracing. And it's, it's that interesting point when young people, when they, um, they don't see a uh, difference. They actually ask the hard questions that we as adults sometimes um, overlook or skate over. Um, and I think if that generation can be coming through, um, I think that starts to help address some of those harder issues that uh, Linda mentioned before. You also mentioned your Reconciliation Action Plans earlier, which have been another strong initiative from Reconciliation Australia, and I guess much more focused on changing culture within workplaces and changing society from that space. I was wondering if you could uh, describe how you assess the effectiveness of Reconciliation Action Plans and ensure that they're more than lip service. What are some of the successes you've actually seen in that space? So um, within the Reconciliation Action Plan program, we actually have four different types of RAPs. And really that's about um, acknowledging where an organisation is in their journey. Uh, not everyone can be uh, at the top and not everyone have the experience or the knowledge and, um, of how to address some of those tougher issues. So at the REFLECT stage, really what we're asking organisations is to think about what they already do in this space, perhaps do a bit of an audit around who their partners are and fundamental to a, a RAP is how do you engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? How do you listen to your uh, staff, how do you listen to your partners, how do you listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations that already perhaps work in that industry or space? Uh, how do you understand what is fundamental to their aspirations and then what is it that your organisation can do? Um, so at the REFLECT level, we're asking people to make that assessment. At an innovate level, we're asking them to try a few different things, put some policies, make some changes. 
build those relationships. Those relationships, respectful relationships, are absolutely fundamental. And then at the stretch and elevate level, that's where we're really pushing organisations. We're asking them to set targets. So whether it's an employment target, whether it's a, a procurement spend, and I can say uh, reconciliation action plan organisations spend over $8.3 billion with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander businesses. And particularly in this time, I think that's really important to continue uh, that commitment as we move forward. But it's more than that. It's also about challenging the attitudes and perceptions of all of their staff. And it's about putting those support mechanisms into their policies and processes so that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people get to thrive, uh, so that uh, staff understand their customer bases of the First Nations people. They understand the circumstances. And they start to unpack some of those things that Linda was talking about in terms of our truth telling uh, and the things that Kay mentioned as well of how industries actually can think about what is unique to their engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So a, a large part of the reconciliation process is about changing the attitudes of Australians and deepening their understanding. But with issues like overrepresentation in the criminal justice sector, the increased rates of Indigenous child removal, the gaps still to close in health, education and income, it's not surprising that many Aboriginal people sometimes express concern that reconciliation hasn't provided enough practical results. But from your perspective as somebody who's deeply embedded in education, how important is that hearts and minds agenda in, in, in order to progress the reconciliation process and to achieve some change in those realities? When I think about the hearts and minds, I think about the symbolism of things like the bridge walk. We need those moments to really bring people together to start a dialogue, but it has to go beyond uh, good intentions, I think as, as, as someone else said earlier, and move towards actions. And, and for me, when I think about that, it, it is about making sure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ways of doing business, no matter what the sector, is actually embedded. So at the moment, we've seen a lot of conversation around uh, our histories and, and starting that truth-telling process, which is fantastic. But then I think we need to actually take that knowledge and embed it and move it beyond just changing attitudes and beliefs. And we're actually when we actually change attitudes and beliefs and start changing systems, that's when we'll start to see a reduction in things like children in out-of-home care. We'll actually start seeing less of our mob in jail. I mean, this is stuff that really hurts us as communities, which is why all of us are so passionate about progressing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs and, and reconciliation. But it really does require the 97%, so 3% of the population is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, but the 97% to start going and, and thinking about about how they're contributing to this situation and even in small ways and thinking about addressing that personally. And then we'll see significant change. So the symbolism is fantastic. It what brings us together and creates a movement, but we need to go beyond the symbolism. Uh, Ken White, you and Linda Burney have done a lot of work collaboratively in your time in Parliament on the issue of constitutional recognition. And during your work in that space, you've travelled around the country and listened to people uh, talk about their aspirations. What are the key messages you've heard when people talk about their ambitions for the future? I see. One thing that I have repeated to me all the time is who's listening to us? Who's working with us to have practical solutions. And when are you guys going to sit down and plan things with us jointly? And that's been a common theme. Constitutional recognition is still important, but I think that we have to look at the way in which we engage our people, and governments have to do this, to sit down with them and jointly plan the delivery of programs. As two prime ministers have said, don't do things to people, do it with them. And I think that is probably the element that's going to be critical for every level of government. Stop doing things, do with. Uh, on the constitutional recognition, our people have always been keen on that and there is ongoing work. And Linda and I do have discussions along with our other colleagues on a range of matters because whilst we represent uh, an electorate or uh, in a state issue, every constituent, we're still passionate. We haven't lost the fire that we had in our bellies when we were young. We want to see a better future for our children and our people and our communities. 
Uh, Minister White, many of those aspirations would have been similar to aspirations that were around 20 years ago around 20 years ago that were captured by the work of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. What um, things have changed that make you think those aspirations are more achievable now than they were back then? I think the impact of reconciliation in opening the minds of Australians to working and walking beside us has made that difference and I see that uh, reflected in a lot, a lot of the work that's happening. Uh, I think um, Summer had her article in which she talked about three types of people. What I'm seeing is more people who are wanting to work with us so that they can see a better outcome. And I, I, that, that's, been an out, that's been as a result of reconciliation, uh, as well as communities themselves being very blunt in saying things have got to change. And when you look at the collection of uh, stories that have been told, our truth telling and our true history is now being shared and that is making a difference. So we continue to take these steps, we will continue to see change occur. And I think what we've done over those 20 years, collectively as Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, is changing the landscape, landscape of this country, which is very different to what it was pre that. Well, speaking of changing landscapes, Linda Burney, at the time of the bridge walks, there was only one Aboriginal member of Parliament, Senator Aidan Ridgway. <laughs> and today, both major parties have Indigenous representatives. Um, so to what extent do you think this greater visibility, not just in Parliament, but in a lot of our key institutions, has made uh, in, in the reconciliation process? Critical mass makes an enormous difference. Uh, I've seen time and time again, Larissa, that you know you might have one or two doctors, you might have one or two lawyers, and young people see, well, if they can do it, well, maybe I can do it, and it all becomes uh, much more possible. Uh, when I became a member of parliament, which was way back in 2003, there were three things that motivated me. There weren't enough women, there weren't enough blackfellas, and I'd worked all my life for social justice, and I thought those, uh, those were pretty good reasons to put myself forward to run um, in a mainstream parliamentary position. And one of the points, and I think Kim was alluding to it, uh, that's really important is that I represent the seat of Barton. I, I'm not elected to represent Aboriginal people, but uh, and what you're saying is that what Aboriginal people take into the parliament is an Aboriginal perspective, and that is so important. Parliaments are supposed to reflect the people that they're making decisions about, and they haven't been um, representative. There haven't been enough women, there certainly haven't been enough Aboriginal people, um, people with a disability, and so it goes. Those things are changing. Uh, have they changed quickly enough? Probably not. But they are changing now. Um, and that makes a difference because your opinion is sought, you will listen to, and you can put a worldview that's different to other people's worldview. Just following up on that, um, you have worked collaboratively with Minister Wyatt. There's a, a, a very visible collegiality amongst the Indigenous members of Parliament. But you have to navigate the broader policies of your parties. To what extent mm. is bipartisanship possible on Indigenous issues? Bipartisanship is possible and I, I hope that uh, we demonstrate that. Uh, but my view has always been a very strong one, and that is that bipartisanship, and this is not because of my role in the federal parliament, I've always thought this, that bipartisanship cannot be a race to the bottom. And quite often bipartisanship is uh, arriving at a position that everyone can agree with, which often leaves out the hard issues. Bipartisanship is really dealing with those difficult issues and coming to a position um, for, for as long as it takes. Uh, there are certain issues, uh, for example, First Nations issues, issues around domestic violence that are way above politics. 
Um, and that's the way that I like to see, like to think about it. But that doesn't mean that politics don't uh, doesn't uh, doesn't become part of the discussion. I guess, in the spirit of bipartisanship, I should just check and see if Ken White wanted to add anything to what you just said. No, no, look, I, I agree with Linda, and I've always believed that bipartisanship is critical in a number of areas, and I concur with the, the same comments that Linda has made. So, and we will continue to work that way, even though we will have philosophical differences based on our party structures. But that's the beauty of a democracy and that's the beauty of our society. Karen Mundine, it remains the fact that racism is a real part of the experience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. It comes up in a lot of surveys as the most critical mm -hmm. issue that people feel they're facing. How do we assess reconciliation against that lived experience? Yeah, look, it's a really good point, Larissa. And, you know, those levels of racism and the experience of racism by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people remains unacceptably high, that's without a doubt. Um, what we've seen in our um, surveys over the last years, um, four or five years, is that that number has stubborn, stubbornly stayed the same. It hasn't really reduced. Um, I think there's a couple of things to consider within that and, and thinking about what's changed. What we have seen in the broader community is that people are more aware of racism. Um, racism happens, it's about fear, it's about ignorance. Um, but in the general community, as we've created this greater understanding of the last 20 years, is that people now are more aware of it and people are more likely um, to, to speak out about it. Uh, we saw that, um, unfortunately, with Adam Goods in the last year of his playing career. Um, the, the things that happened to him which were unspeakable and uh, just awful. But what we also saw, saw come out of that was so many Australians raising the question of why people were booing and also raising the question and naming it as racism. Uh, what we also saw was over a hundred organisations, many of whom had reconciliation action plans, who signed up to a public letter denouncing what was happening to Adam at the time. Um, and they saw that as part of their role in reconciliation to speak out against racism. But I guess it's more than just those individual instances. It's also, as I think Summer mentioned before, it's about the systems. It's about institutional racism. And again, the work that we try and do with our reconciliation action plans in Narragana Wally is how do we address the bias that sits within our institutions and our organisations that are part of the systems and the processes that continue to see these unacceptable outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So um, it is something that we are very conscious of. It makes up one of the five dimensions that we talk about when we talk about reconciliation. Uh, it is something that we need to address both at an individual personal level, but also at that systemic level. Uh, Summer May Finlay, Minister Wyatt referred earlier to some deep thinking you've done about the role of Indigenous people in the reconciliation movement. I was wondering if you could share your thoughts about the role for people that are interested in supporting reconciliation. So I wrote an article which was published in Crokey last night around looking at the different ways people engage at the moment in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. There's the tokenistic approach, which where people do it on a superficial level. Then there's the allies that stand with us but still aren't confident enough to maybe go the whole hog and become accomplices. And I think that we need people to actually start thinking about how to change the way they do business to make sure that they are really understanding what we need as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and supporting us through those processes. And for Aboriginal people, I have to say, reconciliation is something that will be ongoing. And we are very optimistic as Aboriginal peoples. We have to be. Because ultimately, if we're not optimistic, we're accepting the status quo, and the status quo is just not acceptable. And particularly, as Karen talked about, with racism. And when I think about racism, I think about there's a bit of a, a challenge with racism. People have a, a people can identify, and, and this is both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, identify blatant racism. We know what that looks like. But it's the microaggressions and the casual racism which people struggle to identify and call out, and that's the really insidious 
racism because it's death by a thousand cuts. You actually can't see us walking down the streets bleeding because of the racism that we're experiencing because it's so well hidden. And I think that we need to have Aboriginal people collectively, which is what we do, call out racism like with Adam Goods, but we also need non-Aboriginal Australians to continue calling it out and we need more people to be calling it out so that we actually end up with less and less racism to the point where hopefully we can get to a point where there is absolutely no racism. Um, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation delivered a roadmap. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody similarly delivered a roadmap, as did the Bringing Them Home report. And now we've had the Uluru Statement from the Heart, all delivering very ambitious agendas. Linda, I've got another clip from you back in 2000 um, when you said this about the impact of reconciliation at the time. The generation you have around, around this table, or the couple of generations, Let's think about the next generation. Reconciliation has taken hold in this country. It is pass, part and parcel of the daily dialogue of this country. School curriculums deal with it. We have a generation of young people that are going to think this is normal, not unusual, not a side issue as it's been treated. Secondly, is what the Council has to do in the next six months before it tables its final, final document. It has to go out and make that document live. It has to sell it to state governments, it has to sell it to territory governments, it also has to get commitments from peak groups. But certainly the agenda, the, the agenda forward now, that, now that it's taken hold, has to be about rights and it has to be about our inherent rights as Indigenous people. And if treaty is part of that, that is the debate that needs to be had and will be had from here on in. Linda, do you feel like we're still talking about the same issues today? It's really amazing. I was looking at many of the bridge photos and looking at the placards that people were carrying. Uh, some people were carrying placards about constitutional reform. Many placards were about uh, the issue of the apology, but also many people uh, placards were about treaty. And during '88, we also had the uh, sovereign treaty uh, movement as well. Do you remember the little um, little pins with the the three hands uh, that became very well known during '88, which stood for treaty. Um, treaty is still very much on the agenda. Um, and it is, thankfully, Larissa, uh, being taken up by a number of state and territory jurisdictions. Uh, Victoria is well on the way. Northern Territory started a process. Queensland has started a process. South Australia had. It's been interrupted, but I'm sure that that will start again. Um, and we're also, of course, having that discussion at the federal level. Um, it is inevitable to me that a treaty or treaties will be delivered. I, I'm not going to put a time frame on it. I'm sad that it's, it's still a, an ongoing issue, but it is a just settlement that this country must have, or just settlements, and that, to me, is what treaty is about. The, the roadmap for reconciliation and the other roadmaps I spoke to, including the Uluru Statement from the Heart, mm. are very complex. But I was wondering, just for you personally, with the things that you're passionate about, what are the key priorities? Well, each one of those, uh, those reports that you spoke to, and um, perhaps if they'd been adopted and not cherry-picked by state and territory and federal governments, then... Uh, we wouldn't be seeing some of the social justice outcomes that we see today. But all of them uh, recommended this issue of a just settlement, a treaty, um, uh, a, a process that would lead us to a point where there was equity. Um, and those things for me, um, I was passionate about them 20 years ago and I'm just as passionate about them now. And Karen, from those complex roadmaps of all the work that needs to be done, for you personally, what are the priorities? Where are, where are your greatest passions in what needs to happen next? Um, as we've talked about quite a, a lot today, um, truth-telling and, and really unpacking uh, those stories of our past and our history um, is really uh, important for us moving forward. Um, I think all of those other things that uh, 
we, we just talked about in terms of treaty, in terms of just settlements. Um, I think there's also a really interesting kind of uh, flip side to those conversations happening in the parliaments and in the, the broader community and that's also uh, with native title and with um, uh, community groups coming through and asserting their sovereignty um, using those mechanisms and we, we see that with our governance awards, uh, particularly Yaru up there in, in the Kimberley, but right across this country where people are through the rights that have been um, won over the last 20 or more years, actually uh, turning those into uh, an assertion of their sovereignty and, and their rights within that. But certainly for reconciliation, um, this idea of truth-telling, this idea of historical acceptance, so knowing more than just uh, those dates or things that happened in the past, but understanding how those things uh, shape who we are today and uh, how we actually need to change things to move forward into the future. Uh, Ken White, I want to, before I ask you about your priorities and passions going forward, just ask the same question I asked Linda Burney. Obviously, in your position, people come to you a lot with their issues. And I was just wondering, from your perspective, do you feel like we are talking about the same issues as we were talking about 20 years ago? Well, when I, when I reflect back on those reports, we are. And, and that's why the Prime Minister had a discussion with Pat Turner and in reshaping the agreement for closing the gap, it's being jointly negotiated, word by word, clause by clause. And there is a partnership now with state and territory ministers in this whole construct, along with first ministers. We had a meeting in the cabinet room where we had indigenous people sitting, talking about what the future should look like for the work on closing the gap. It was a powerful moment. And we're close to now finalising that report and that agreement to sign off and commit to focusing on the very things that impact on our lives on a daily basis at every uh, level across this nation. In terms of the voice and truth telling, their priorities for me, constitutional recognition is a priority. But getting the everyday elements of life that our people experienced addressed through closing the gap is, is important in the way that we deliver on that. And I want to see a better future when I walk out into a community. And I know Linda has the same experiences when we've been out there and we've seen disparity in a first world nation. That's what I want to change. Summer May Finlay, in that broad, ambitious agenda that's been put forward by so many uh, reports and, of course, by the Uluru Statement from the Heart, for you personally, what is the priority and, and where will you put your energy? Where's your passion? My passion and my priority is supporting the Uluru Statement in its entirety. I want to see all of the recommendations in the Uluru Statement adopted. I feel like if we actually do that, and yes, we haven't worked out the nuts and bolts, and they are things that will need to be determined, but if the principles are actually adopted by government and then actually developed with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, we're going to see a better future because we will have a treaty, we will actually have uh, a voice to parliament, and we will also have that truth-telling process. And I think once we actually have all three of those components, we're going to see an exponential change in this country. And for me, you know, I haven't got children yet. I had a good life. I had a better life than my mum. I want a better life for my children when I have them. And I want them to be a part of this country in a way that celebrates their Aboriginality. And I think the Uluru Statement will help my children have that opportunity. Just picking up then on the uh, implementation of the uh, roadmap set from the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Minister White, how how um, far do you think that, that that can be achieved? What what are your hopes for its implementation? Look, I think when we consider the suite of things that we're doing, many of the principles will be encapsulated. The voice to parliament is the challenging one. Uh, but nevertheless, establishing the voice from community upwards will build to that. I appreciate uh, the comments that uh, some are made because from my perspective as well, it is about a better future for my children, but for their children. And to achieve this, we have to look at sets of principles that are around co-designing, around engaging our people as partners in the planning, 
for a better country, a better future, but they sit as equals in that process and are listened to. Linda Burney, what are your thoughts on the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart? The party that I represent, Larissa, the Labor Party, endorses the Uluru Statement in its entirety. That is enshrining a voice to the Constitution, um, establishing a Makarata Commission which is going to lead to agreement and treaty making and a national process of truth-telling. We've also said we'll be informed by the co-design process, uh, which is very important. Um, I can't be any clearer than that about where uh, the position of the Labor Party sits. Uh, I think that the um, time frame for constitutional recognition is becoming very tight. And I look forward to hearing what the plans are in relation to that. Well, we've looked back over the bridge walks. We've identified how far we've come and how far we have yet to go. But I wanted to ask each of you um, a question that I know we're often asked as Aboriginal people, and that is what your vision is now for a reconciled Australia. And, Summer, I might start with you. I, I still think that reconciliation will be an ever ongoing process, but I think we'll actually hit a point where we can talk about having successes more broadly in a reconciliation is when Aboriginal people can just be Aboriginal people in Australia, where we are engaged honestly and truthfully in all processes that impact us. And we're starting to see some of that happen, as uh, Minister Wyatt talked about. But I think it's when Aboriginal people just feel comfortable to be themselves and to practice their culture and walk in this world knowing that they are accepted for who and what they are. And what about you, Karen, your vision for a reconciled Australia? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Summer. Um, at Reconciliation in Australia, we talk about a just, equitable and reconciled Australia. And essentially what that means is, as Summer said, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, we're embraced by the broader Australian community and we can be ourselves. Uh, we can uh, be, do, think and be part of this nation proudly as First Nations peoples. And Ken White, how do you describe your vision for a reconciled Australia? A country that won't justify us by the colour of our skin or by mm -hmm determining whether we're quarter or whatever, the old terminology, but to accept us for the richness we bring as individuals and as a culture to this nation. We have lived here for 60,000 years. We have never reconciled for that. So all I want to see in a future Australia is each and every one of us are accepted for who we are that our pride in ourselves and our culture is not questioned, but is accepted as we accept many other cultural groups without questioning their identity. And Linda Burney, for you, what does a reconciled Australia look like? A reconciled Australia for me is where our sovereignty as First Nations people is accepted, celebrated, and seen as integral to the identity of this country. Well, as Summer said, we're all optimists. <laughs> Thank you so much. My guests have been the Honourable Ken Wyatt, the Honourable Linda Burney, Karen Mundine, CEO of Reconciliation Australia and researcher and lecturer from the University of Wollongong, Summer May Finlay. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been 20 Years On, Crossing Bridges for Reconciliation, brought to you by the ABC in conjunction with Reconciliation Australia. I'm Larissa Berendt.